Aloha and welcome back to our YouTube channel. Stacy here with Hawaii Wildlife Fund. Today I got something really special for all you adults that want to learn more about marine debris. Megan Lampson did a Zoom class presentation uh, with a HCC students and Miss Alana Stout. And so we're excited to share that with you. So buckle up folks, get ready to learn a lot of really cool information. Take it away, Meg. Hey, aloha. This is the what day is it? April 29th. Um, Social Science 111 recording. And we were scheduled to have Senna Baring here today, but she is um, she had to postpone. She's gonna be here on Monday instead. And instead, we are very welcome to have the wonderful Megan Lamson, who works with Hawaii Wildlife Fund and is here to talk to us, to talk trash with us a little bit, is what you're saying, yeah? Um, so we're going to um, hear from Megan about um, waste, some waste issues. We're starting up our waste unit, which is how we're gonna finish the semester for this class. And after her presentation, we'll talk a little bit about logistics and homework things and the end of the semester stuff. What I would like you to do is if you have questions, for, this is kind of a question driven um, event. So if you have questions for her as she's going through the presentation, go, just go ahead and type them into the chat box and then we can, um, we can take questions during, during pauses or during breaks. We'll go over those questions. Sound good? Okay. Anything else you'd like to add, Megan? Nope. Um, Sorry to disappoint you, I'm not Senna, but <laughs> that's okay. I will be talking about plastic pollution along the coastline, and it's a good segue. Um, and as a team member with the Department of Environmental Management and also big part of the zero waste movement on island, so hopefully her presentation on Monday will complement the one I'm going to give right now. Yes. So with that, I will start sharing my screen if that's okay. All right, let me play it. Wait, everyone sees that? You are the virtual online teaching realm, right on. Okay, so like your teacher Miss Stout said, I'm Megan Lamson. I'm a marine biologist with Hawaii Wildlife Fund. I've been honored to be working and volunteering a small nonprofit for the past 12 years. And I also work part-time for the State of Hawaii's Division of Aquatic Resources in West Hawaii. So today I'll be focusing mostly on our plastic pollution, both prevention and recovery efforts along the Ka'u coastline. If you have any questions outside of the, that realm, um, we can field that towards the end as well. So I'll talk a little bit about Hawaii Wildlife Fund, who we are, some global statistics about plastic pollution, marine debris, our own recovery efforts, as well as prevention efforts, and some of the aspects of policy angles, as well as different art and advocacy issues, um, hopefully that are relevant for this island and this class. For those of you who are less familiar with us, Hawaii Wildlife Fund is a small, but we like to say mighty nonprofit organization. We were founded in 1996 by William Gilmartin and Hannah Bernard, and this is kind of a mix of our Hawaii Islands team. We've got about half a dozen contractors on Hawaii Islands and Maui. And our mission is to protect native wildlife. So we do that through research, we do that through education, conservation, a little bit of advocacy. So we have a lot of different projects, including protected species monitoring and protection efforts, environmental education, but really I'll be focusing on our marine debris project today um, and waste, like Ellen. So these are some of the other things that we are involved in, including anguline pool restoration, some of the local IA wetland restoration efforts, hospital sea turtle monitoring and nest protection, as well as monk seal recovery efforts, environmental education for Keiki. So again, if any of this stuff is fascinating to you, please put it in the notes section. 
feel free to reach out later and we can talk more about any of that. But yeah, on to the plastic pollution realm. So living here in Hawaii, we are the most remote archipelago in the world, um, and yet the oceans connect us. And so we are connected from the air that we breathe to the food that we're, we're accessing. And as you see in this, this slide, this um, map that NOAA has provided, we're also connected um, through the oceans to a worldwide, um, worldwide realm of trash. So you've heard of giant garbage patch. I think if you can see my cursor right here, that is this right here. Based on the prevailing winds and currents, so these are wind-driven currents, you got the California current here, the North Pacific current, the Kuroshio currents next to Japan, and the North Equatorial current. These winds drive the currents, and this area in the middle is kind of like the doldrums. There's less winds, and so it's an accumulation zone. So things that float, whether that be driftwood logs or plankton or plastic, for example, will find itself kind of concentrated in the center. So just um, the sheer fact of our location in the middle of the North Pacific here, the Hawaiian archipelago kind of acts like a sieve and we accumulate an awful lot of plastic pollution and, and floating debris, green debris from around the North Pacific basin. And as you're all well aware, um, it is a long archipelago. Um, we are located on Hawaii Island, but the whole Northwestern Hawaiian Islands and main Hawaiian Islands do collect marine debris. This is a problem throughout the archipelago. So what is marine debris? I'm kind of using that interchangeably with plastic pollution. We'll talk about that a little later. NOAA, or the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, defines marine debris as any man-made object that finds its way into a waterway or at the ocean. So it can be very small, like these microplastics here, to large objects like propane cylinders or tanks, tires, bottles, containers, toys, you name it, we've seen it. But this is any sort of man-made object. So it is not just plastic. It's anything man-made. Lumber technically is marine debris. It was made from a natural product, but it has been reformulated by man, and so now it's considered marine debris. So like I said, it can come in many different shapes and sizes. We have found a lot of army men, a lot of other different toys along our shoreline. And when you come to the beach, it can look relatively clean like this, and it's all relative. Um, it can also look rather dirty. But for example, here, mo and most of the items that we're seeing on the beach don't have any sort of like identifying features or, or ways that we can associate it with where where it might have come from or even what it might have been used for in the past. However, some of them do, like this um, dishwashing detergent bottle from China. And others we can clearly associate with local debris. So when this washed in, um, it was actually still valid, the registration, so I'm not sure what the story was with this vehicle. Um, but clearly this did not wash, away, wash in from elsewhere or out of state. It definitely was local trash. But then other things washed in, like this boat hole, we have no idea what the story is or where it came from. So marine debris is a global problem, but we don't like that to kind of overwhelm us to a point of inaction, and we like to kind of focus on the solution. So it is a global problem, but there are things that we could each do individually and as a class and as a community, an island community, or a state or a nation, to address this problem and, and to prevent marine debris and plastic pollution from grading our, our environment. Kind of some background. This is a study that was published by Jenna Jam back about five years ago using data from 2010, so it's already a little outdated, but it's frightening. The estimated of the 192 coastal countries worldwide are producing almost 300 million metric tons of plastic waste annually. And so if anything, and as you can see from this cumulative plastic um, production part, the, the usage is increasing every year. And, so, and of course, because it isn't going away, if it's cumulative year after year, you're looking up there and 2015, we had already produced well over 7 billion tons. This is a huge problem. Of the 275 million metric tons produced in 2010, they estimated at least 5 million of them would enter the ocean. 
how is this happening? Is it intentional? Is it accidental? Is it because of corporations or the government or is it because of individuals or the fishing industry? A little bit of all of the above. But um, another paper published by Chris Schmidt all a couple years ago talked about a modeling that he did based on 10 river catchments worldwide. And he found that 90% of the debris in the world's oceans were actually coming from rivers, and rivers in Asia and two in Africa. And I share this because it's best to share all of the latest and greatest science available, but not to sort of move or shift the blame way someone else. Because as I mentioned earlier, marine debris is man-made. And so it's a people problem. It was created by people and that's gonna take all of us to combat this. So even if a lot of the plastic pollution is coming from rivers in Asia, that's not to say that that might not be debris that we purchased and then quote unquote properly disposed of, potentially tried to recycle or threw away and wasn't just shipped back to Asia to recycle and was lost in this process. A lot of it is solid waste management issues, which Senna can address on Monday. But, you know, these are, it, these are land-based sources that are finding their way into land-based trash that are finding their way into the ocean. So it's not just an ocean-based problem. It's not all coming from the fishing industry. Let's see. I see we have some chats. Do we, is it a good time to stop and ask questions or? We can stop and take some questions if you'd like. We have two, we have a couple, there's been a couple, um, Somebody came in, but we have a couple questions also already. Um, not specifically about the material that you covered. Do you want to stop and take questions right now, Megan? What, what is clever? <laughs> the, the first is what advancements are being made in recycling plastics? And then also, does plastic ever biodegrade? So I don't know if maybe. Great questions. We will, I will be covering some of that. But if I don't cover enough of it, please ask them again later. Yeah, that is coming. Great questions. I keep the questions coming, guys. Um, Thank you. Oh, how? <laughs> totally. Why don't you keep cool. going and we'll, we'll ask more questions in a bit. Okay, sounds great. So um, we will discuss a little bit of um, disposal efforts and, and new innovations with recycling later. Um, this paper was published actually last year. Uh, we, along with many other researchers on various different islands, contributed to it. And we basically sent uh, a random sample of plastic pollution that we found on our beaches to researchers on Oahu with the Center of Marine, uh, Marine Debris Research at HPU. And they analyzed them onto the polymer level. So there are different types of plastic and some of them sink and some of them float. So when they're released into the environment, they will separate based on their buoyancy um, into the various different environmental departments. And so for example, this, this graphic I love, but it's a little bit hard to wrap your head around because our windward side, like this is our Hilo East side right here, but it's on the left side. And I don't know, maybe that's just me, it's hard. Um, what a lot of the debris, for example, that we find on our windward beaches, um, so Hoku on Oahu or Milo on the southeast corner on Hawaii Island, are these potentially high density polyethylenes and polypropylenes um, versus some of the things you might see on the Konas or the leeward side, which are, you know, cellulose acetate cigarette butts, um, polystyrene, this is in particular the expanded polystyrene, things like foam containers, and so polystyrene actually which is um, the ingredient in a lot of your utensils, for example, will sink, as will, so number one, plastic water bottles, they are denser or heavier than seawater. And so if they don't have air trapped inside a water bottle, they'll actually sink to the ocean floor. Um, same with a uh, like, uh, plastic fork. Whereas if you have a styrofoam container and you, you put air, you infuse air into the polystyrene and make a clamshell, that, that will float versus sink. So. Anyways, it's a little bit of the chemistry involved. This will this also drives down line plastic and marine debris in particular, kind of like the capacity or the potential ability for us to recycle these are based on the types of plastics that are washing ashore. 
So why do we care? Why should you care? This is a threat, a serious threat to marine wildlife. It's negatively impacting wildlife on many different angles. It's directly through ingestion um, and entanglement, and then indirectly potentially through bioaccumulation and um, things that have adsorbed onto plastics or been included in the plastic production efforts, things like phthalates that make plastic author, for example, are pretty toxic to wildlife and, and humans alike. Something were to ingest this and then was absorbed into their system, it could also have sublethal impacts on the critters. Marine debris also has issue, you know, could potentially and does strangle and smother and snap off our coral reefs here. Our, our reefs are reliant on sunlight. Those ozenthale that live inside of each of our coral polyps need um, kind of the, the starch and the food that is created by these single cell algae to survive. It's about 90% of their food source. And so if you cover it with anything, whether it's the shade of a boat for too long or a fishing net, it will eventually kill it. And unfortunately, marine debris and plastic pollution is kind of this new novel vector for being marine, um, marine aquatic invasive species to Hawaii. Things that might not have survived on a log are now, you know, living on a buoy and floating their way here, for example, like these gooseneck barnacles in the crab on the photo in the bottom right corner. And then come to think of it, we are also part of the marine food chain. You know, if you eat any fish, um, any seafood in general, you could potentially then be having the effects of bioaccumulation. So plankton are eating small pieces of plastic pollution, small microplastic and nanoplastic particles, and then those are being consumed by slightly larger organisms, like let's say an opelu, and then those are being consumed by slightly larger organisms, like an ahi, and then potentially oh, so these, these are issues both for our wildlife and for our communities that are reliant on fish and seafood for um, sustenance. That's kind of how we got involved because we're trying to protect native wildlife. This is a Hawaiian monk seal called out and resting at Camilo near a net pile, which they are want to do. This is clearly an issue. Something to, that I kind of added in and um, your teacher can forward the link for this, this um, to you later. There was a report done by the Center for International Environmental Law last year that really analyzed the connection between plastics and, the, and climate and how here on an island too where we're really worried about sea level rise and impacts of climate change. Last uh, warming event several years ago knocked out 50% of our live coral cover here in West Hawaii. It's really important that we start reducing our greenhouse gas emissions in plastic, the production Harvest the production, recycling, and transport of plastics is really a big component of that. So it's something to be mindful of and I think is really relevant for, for your class in particular. Yes, I agree. So, um, yeah. Was that another question? Okay. So what are we, are we doing about it? We are trying to remove as much as possible and then also just talk story about plastic pollution and innovate solutions and work um, as a team and as individuals to reduce our, our plastic emissions here locally. Collectively, over the past dozen years, we, plus like 20 years, we've removed over 337 tons of marine debris, primarily from this island, followed by Maui, Maui and the French Frigate Shoals. So working together, we can really address this problem. No, but we have to expand that reach to an international level if we're going to really work to turn off the tap of plastic pollution. So how we're doing it here locally is primarily through volunteers. About 95% of our efforts are volunteer driven. We do have a small amount of paid part-time um, contractors and staff, but mostly they're volunteers. And so it's sweat equity and this is our, our strength and our, our best equipment available. So we've done beach cleanups from the Northwestern Mine Islands um, all the way down to, to Camilo. And I think we had something like 71 beach cleanups last year. We've had to cancel a few since uh, coronavirus arrived, but we are looking forward to continuing our efforts as soon as is safely possible. So 
here are some of the cleanup sites. I don't know if you can see that, but over the past 11 or so years that I've been collecting data, these are some of the sites that we've worked on on Hawaii Island, so the little red dots. And as you can see, a lot of them are clustered at the southeast corner of the island, just because that's where the, the majority of plastic pollution is accumulating. Why is that? Here's an example. Why? Okay, so based on what we talked about earlier about the various plastic types and their density types, it will impact how, like, how they sit in the ocean and how they are transported. So things that are more buoyant are going to travel faster, that are, that are more of the object that is floating out of the water are going to be pushed by winds, versus things that are lower lying in the water, um, a little bit dense in the water column, they're going to move slow, slower and they're going to be more um, transported through a current. And so for the most part, it's, it's wind driven, so more of the northeast corners of the main Hawaiian Islands at least, impacted by so the trades that are coming in and you know the, the the larger prevailing current systems are accumulating everything kind of to the northeast of the Hawaiian archipelago but it's the winds that are bringing them in however which is not the case um both in Molokai and on Hawaii Island are our southeast corners that is actually most impacted so this is a picture from 2005 at Kamilo Point kind of like what it was looking like before we had been there for long and some of the cleanup efforts that we've hosted over the years. And, and our, these are some of the stats that we've compiled. On average, 80, about 81 pounds are collected per person at our cleanup events over 10 years of data. And we have collected a total of 288 tons of debris on this island since 2003. So it's kind of a frightening number. You can kind of imagine that somewhere between like 300, 350 extra large trucks, like dump truck beds full of plastic pollution removed from our shores, mostly on this that 10 mile stretch from Kalai towards Camilo. We also run uh, net recovery patrols. These are smaller efforts, like targeted to coves that are dirtier or have larger accumulations of marine debris between our community cleanup events. And so we've got a truck that has been kind of customized. It's got a dump. We have a winch that sits on top of the truck and we use a winch and an old logging hook to actually pull the net up into our, our rain, either load them into our truck or trailer and then haul them to the Waiohinu transfer station. So I don't know if anyone has been to the transfer station, um, but that's where we store our nets in Waiohinu and there's something like 10 tons there right now. We shipped about 19,000 pounds in March over to Oahu. Oahu. That's what our old truck looks like with one of the volunteers in our net pile. And that's our new truck. So if you ever see it, give it a shock up. Um, that's the winch up here that we use to pull the net. And then we have this like aluminum frame bed just so we can haul more debris. And for the nets, we are contributing to the, the NOAA Nets to Energy Partnership. And so because landfills are bulging and we would like to reuse as much as possible and divert things from landfill. We have shipped 13 containers in total to Oahu, full of something like 250,000 pounds to be incorporated into their H power plant. It's, it's combusted and turned into electricity for the city and county of um, Honolulu. That's kind of like the big stuff. Um, some other innovations we've been working on and address our microplastic pollution, which ecologically is probably the most frightening because it could really work its way up into all of the food chain. We work with a group of uh, 12 engineering students from Quebec in Canada over a couple years and their mechanical engineering project was to create basically a marine debris vacuum. Um, and so this was done as a, a class and they came out here and field tested it with us. It's still here on island, they gifted it to us and we hope to bring it back to Camilo and, and finish the job and then find funding to move it from island to island so we can help some of the other beaches um, in the state maintain uh, cleaner, cleaner beaches and get rid of some of the plastic pollution. It's kind of like a synopsis of our efforts on this island over the past um, almost 16, 17 years. Let's see. And just to explain what each of these 
Um, lines are represent a year. The yellow is a non-net debris, and the, the blue is the derelict fishing net and line bills. And it shows that it's not all fishing nets. Um, some of them are for shipping and cargo and other industries, but these are like the industrial net and line bundles, the larger bundles like you saw in the previous photos. You notice here, this is actually a function of our first cleanup event. It was a two-day event over one weekend because there was such a backlog from years of not um, cleaning up the area. And so one might look here and say, hmm, what happened in March 2011? Well, that's when the um, Great East Japan tsunami happened and they lost a lot of um, human life as well as marine debris was washed out into the ocean and there was a concern that that Japanese tsunami marine debris would flood into our, our shores. And just looking at this, it might give you an idea that, oh wow, look at that up in 2017. That might have had something to do with the tsunami. But if you dig a little deeper into the data, if you can see that, Above each of the columns are the, the number of cleanup events that we hosted that year. So it's not a fair comparison because we're actually hosting more cleanup. For example, like I said, in 2019, we hauled about 58,000 pounds and that was during 71 events. So if you're kind of looking, we're, we're hosting more and more cleanup over the year. We are getting a little bit more now and there, has, there was an uptick in, in large degree in 2017 statewide. Um, it's hard to say if whether that was directly from the tsunami or not. There was a lot of debris coming from around the Pacific well before the tsunami. So um, I just want to kind of come back at Mythbuster that like all of this is from the tsunami because it's not. It's all from humans, but it's from all over. Here is kind of a, um, a graph that shows of, over that same period and collecting data our removal effort. So I showed you where we cleaned. Well, this is where we actually remove the most amount of marine debris. So by weight, um, yellow is like highest density removed and purple is, is lowest. And so you can see here again, it's our southeast corner that's focusing most of the um, removal efforts because that's where it's most concentrated. So this is um, an example of something else that we've been involved with, uh, our um, shoreline cleanup. So we participate in the NOAA Marine Debris Monitoring Project. And so we go to the same area and we have for the last three and a half years. And it's a, it's a hundred meter stretch. It's about 300 feet um, by 10 meters about 30 feet wide of the beach swath. And what we do is we actually count every item. So everything that is bottle cap size, two and a half centimeters or one inch or larger, we count it and we try to classify it into particular categories to get a better idea of just what this composition is coming in. If there is any sort of fluctuation based on seasonality or um, particular industries that are more responsible. And so we've done 35 surveys to date but um, based on the, the data that's been analyzed for the first 33 surveys, we're getting an average of 2,681 pieces in this 100 meter by 10 meter swath. And of this, over 95% of which are plastic. So when I call marine debris plastic pollution and I say it's pretty much the same thing, it pretty much is. The vast majority of what we're seeing is plastic. And somebody asked earlier if it biodegrades. Um, and we will talk about that because um, it is hard, hard to say. But here's an example of a really dirty beach um, when we're doing a cleanup survey. Ironically, this was an area at Milo that we chose specifically because it wasn't as impacted and it typically didn't get as much debris. But some of our surveys have over 6,000 pieces and that's after. So this is a couple hours with a handful of volunteers counting, cleaning, and identifying what is there underneath. Um, so here again, a chart of what we're collecting. Again, most of it is plastic. We're also trying to identify things um, to uh, a brand level. It was done in the Philippines by the Break Free from Plastic group. And we're hoping that we could encourage larger multinational corporations like Nestle or Oral-B. If we let them know, if we sent them a box full of little caps with their Nestle brands on them, that we really, that this was a problem and, and things don't just go away and, and that we were hoping that they could work with us towards solutions and reducing the amount of plastic that they were um, producing for their packaging. And so 
that is important and I guess it goes back to the question of does plastic degrade and as far as we know it doesn't so plastic um, plastic will photodegrade meaning it you know it, it's got these very strong carbon bonds that are synthetic synthetically made plastic bonds. So we're talking about the petroleum-based plastics and even some of the plant-based plastics are things that are not found in nature. And so the, the fungus and the bacteria and the insects that'll break down natural organic material can't do that with plastic, at least not at the levels or at the speeds they do with natural debris. And so as far as we can tell, insofar as that plastic really hasn't been around that long, it was really only mass produced since the 1950s, it is not going away and, and it may take tens to hundreds tens of years, but it hasn't been around that long to know how long it's gonna take. So we say plastic doesn't break down, it breaks up. It breaks up into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces. Meanwhile, while being exposed to ultraviolet radiation, it's releasing greenhouse gases while it's breaking up. So not a great thing to have in the environment. What else we're doing about it? We've kind of hooied up. Um, NOAA has led a group of nonprofit agency um, individual group to reduce marine debris, and we've been working together. So that's pretty constructive from the, the top down um, efforts. We've also been working with our local council people on the island, and, and statewide have really hammered things down from the smoking bans to the plastic bag bans to our foam bands that were done here um, that we're working on one right now for Kauai. And these are really making a difference. So while a lot of the stuff we see at Camilo Point is from elsewhere, there is still a fair amount of local debris there and it's something that we can make a difference in. So we are working with our, our legislators now to move forward some of these sweeping single-use plastics bill and good news in number one was passed in Oahu late um, earlier this month, a couple weeks ago actually, a bill to reduce the amount of disposable plastic products um, contained on Maui Pass, and we're hoping to introduce one here soon. So what do you do about it? And what are our preferred disposal methods? So this is where you get into, okay, what would we really prefer? Reuse as much as possible. Like if you do have a use for a cargo net, like feel free to come join us at one of our next cleanup opportunities. And if you find a net that you would like to use for hauling your rubbish to the dump, you are welcome to reuse it. Our, best thing we can do recycling art research those are all better than all of the other options as you make your way um, we're also pretty involved in environmental education efforts around the island a little bit on Maui and Oahu as well I'm working with the next generation to sort of brainstorm solutions and to get creative about interfacing with art projects for example like this new perspective um, mosaic on the left it doesn't look so large in this picture but it's actually four feet wide by six feet tall and it's made from 1800 bottle caps that were collected over a couple cleanups and um, put together by Maddie May with Upcycle Hawaii and our a, a Girl Scout troop from Hilo and Kona so using our sort of share and spread this message um, that plastic pollution is a huge problem it's global and that we could do something about it there's some other art projects made from plastic um, local entrepreneurs doing things from the debris we're finding some of the other reuse options um, we shipped about six tons to new york and it was used to create a life-size whale that was installed in a canal in bruges belgium and has since traveled to the Netherlands, Shanghai, and I think it's on its way to Singapore now to just convey that same message that yes, this is sad, yes, it's a problem, um, and hopefully inspire something. Recycling options. Plastics are pretty challenging to recycle, um, whatever anyone else tells you. <laughs> they are pretty challenging to recycle, and we all know that on this island, especially since October, we haven't been able to recycle any plastics. The global market has really crashed on that end, but if you turn over any bottle and you see that little recycling symbol, there is nothing stopping anyone from putting a recycling symbol on a bottle. That means, yes, potentially, theoretically, it could be recycled, 
Now, can you recycle it fully? Not necessarily. And so if they put the numbers one through seven, seven being the great big giant other category, that tells you exactly what type of plastic. In general, as you go up in number, it is harder and harder to recycle. And so in all likelihood, when they do reopen plastic recycling on this island, if anything, they'll reopen it to number one and number two plastic. What, if you recall from the slide about the island and then the different distribution of marine pollution, plastic pollution, based on the environmental compartments, we're seeing at Camilo a lot of twos and fours and fives. So these are probably pro they're harder to recycle. We have recycled some of them. We have turned um, our plastic, like a full of plastic like this, into a portion of the plastic used in the method soap bottles. We have shipped super sacks full of our opaque plastics to TerraCycle, and they've used those to incorporate into Procter & Gamble. I think there was a line, Herbal Essences line released last year that had 25%, up to 25% marine debris. These are kind of placeholders. Um, they're not, and, I, and I'm not advocating for anyone's solution. Plastic pollution, marine debris is a global problem, and there isn't a silver bullet. But these are all potential options for us to at least reuse the plastic that's out there versus fighting for oil and continuing to harvest fossil fuels to make more plastic. So another thing we've been researching over the past couple of years uh, is the, the concept of diffusion, making something like building blocks out of plastics. And so we're hopeful that maybe a bifusion facility will come to the state of Hawaii at some point in the near future. And they have been able to incorporate a, an amount of um, fishing nets and Debris that is not recyclable into these blocks. Um, we're not quite there yet. So, with that, um, I guess I just want to leave with kind of a more positive note because when we started, when our co founder Bill Gilmartin started cleanup efforts in 2003, people told him it was impossible, it was too dirty, you couldn't go there, you couldn't, like, why bother? And, and really, this, this is a stark contrast from one cleanup. Um, summer a couple years ago. This was a picture taken in the mid 80s. So we can make a difference. Any one, one person, all of the 288 tons that have been removed now started because Bill wasn't scared by no, he wasn't overwhelmed and he took action. He didn't overwhelmed into inaction. And so yes, we need to turn off the tap. Yes, um, we need to stop using and consuming and disposing mindless amounts of plastic, especially single-use plastics, but yes, you can also do something at an individual or campus or island um, scale. So please come get involved. All of our events have been postponed, but keep in touch. We're really advocating for um, more anti-social cleanups, like hashtag anti-social cleanup is going around right now. Go oh, in Malama your own yard, your own street, your own park, whatever is legal and safe right now. You don't need anyone to host a beach cleanup for you. If you have landowner permission or it's a public place, if you see a piece of trash, that is one potential item that is future marine debris that could ensnare or entangle or injure our native wildlife. So please jump on board. There's different things that you can do on an individual level, even at home, making decisions of what you need, um, what, what is luxury, what is necessity, what you're purchasing, and, and maybe more towards reuse and, and just not consuming things that are designed to be used for five minutes, but will potentially last for hundreds of years. So again, we're all connected and together, um, you know, we can combat this problem. Plastic pollution is a people problem and it's gonna take us all working together to sort of make a dent in this problem and really change the current system. So these are just some of our project partners, hundreds of thousands of volunteer hours. Um, yeah, Marla, for your time. I'm sure you have more questions and I think we have some time. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Megan. You're um, welcome. I'm not sure I answered the breakdown recycling question, but if that person wants more info, yeah, it in or let's go ahead and um, let's go ahead and switch to gallery view and have a little 
and have a little talk story about some of these questions that have come up in chat. 